Well, hey, good morning, church. Welcome. Everybody awake? I'm not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we're going to start our worship service with scripture. Uh, that's the best way to start this, right? Um, so would you stand for the reading of God's word? Our call to worship this morning comes from Hebrews 12. And make sure that you have a booklet with you this week. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And this is the God that we worship this morning. Let's sing together in praise. Praise belongs to you. Let every kingdom bow. Let every ocean roar, let every heart adore you now. Praise belongs to you. What can I do but sing? The greatest joy I found is to lay a crown before my king. Before my king. I've come to worship, I've come to lift up your name, for you deserve this life laid down like the one that you gave. I have but one voice, one heart and one sacrifice, so would you take this life laid down, be glorified, be glorified. belongs to you let songs from children rise you silence all your foes you set your glory in the skies praise belongs to you creation's calling now for the king to be revealed O oh, King of Heaven, come down. O King of Heaven, come down. I've come to worship. I've come to lift up your name. For oh, you deserve this. Life laid down like the one that you gave. I have but one voice, one heart. for us today. Uh, this is our Prayers of the People time in our service. Week after week, we have a moment in our worship service where we get to hear many different things and pray over many, many different things. And this morning, we're going to be talking about part of the future of our church and praying over that together. So I'm going to ask Mark Flanagan to join me up front. 
Um, about three months ago or so, maybe a little more than that, a small group within our church, uh, me and Mark included, uh, began, well, I'll tell you, it's Mark and me and, and Kaylin Smith and Chad and Taylor Johnson, uh, began meeting together to discuss the future of our gathering location as a church. Uh, I know in a morning like this it may not feel like it, but we're starting to outgrow Meadowbrook. Uh, there are some weeks where you know that it's where we're, most every chair is full. So uh, we know that this is becoming a pressing need for us as a church as God continues to grow us. And so we've been meeting together to discuss how might this work? Where might God lead us? What could we actually do? Uh, and so Mark and Kaylin and Chad and Taylor all have some uh, various expertise and knowledge that would be helpful for us as we do that. And so I wanted to have Mark share with us some of his thoughts as Mark is, is um, actually kind of chairing this process for us. And so Mark, tell us a little bit like how did, how did you get wrangled into this and <laughs> what are, what are, what's some of the experience that you have that kind of helps us as a church and just what you bring to the table with this? Well, first of all, I don't know that I have a lot of experience that's relevant, but I'm an attorney and I did when I was in private practice, work on some real estate transactions. So I think that knowledge is helpful to the process. And also in my current job, we've been opening a lot of offices. So I have some experience just finding real estate for uh, our offices as, as we expand. But mostly um, just saw a need for it. And I want to be helpful as much as I can. And uh, I know you've got more important things to be doing. So I'm just trying to help out where I can. Yeah. Well, and you also at uh, a church that you and Risha were at before this, you helped with that too. Yes, we did. Uh, we were at a church before that lost our building and a denomination change, and I was involved in that committee. Uh, yeah. So have a little experience directly doing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm super grateful for Mark to be doing this with us because this this is not my expertise at all. So to have people who have done these types of things before in different venues is very helpful to say the least. So um, why don't you describe for us a little bit like the process that our team is taking as we go into this this look, this search. So yeah, we really started this effort fairly recently, and I kind of look at it as you know maybe three phases. Really, right now I think we're in the information gathering phase. Um, we're kind of looking at the area that we're interested in, just trying to figure out what's available. I mean, there are various options. You know, leasing a bigger space, maybe taking a commercial space and converting it into uh, a church, or possibly finding a church that. Uh, you know, is either grown out of their space or is uh, just not succeeding and is moving out of that. So it's kind of an information gathering phase, um, thinking about our space needs and things like that. And I think that the process is to go out and talk to a lot of people, let people know we're looking, try to get more information. And then at some point when we kind of have gathered a better idea of what maybe it will look like and what we can afford, getting a bigger group involved, uh, consulting with like Alex about the worship and Risha about the children's ministry and get some other leadership and other church members involved in the process once we sort of define what we're looking for. Yeah. What, is there anything that has you encouraged about what we're finding so far or how would you think, how would you share that with, with us as a, as a congregation today? So yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, there are obviously some challenges. Uh, you know, the area that we are looking in tends to not have any open space prices tend to be a little higher here. Um, you know, the finances are a little tricky, obviously. Um, but we did have a really good meeting with a group that um, is really in the business of helping people get into church spaces. Mostly they focus on buildings that have been used as churches and bringing in new, uh, more vibrant congregations. So that was a super good conversation that we had with them. And uh, so, you know, I think there's some opportunities out there after talking to them, and we'll just have to keep praying and uh, hope a good opportunity comes up. Yeah, and just for context for everybody, we, to give you an idea of, like, low geography, like, where are we, where are we talking about? Where, where are we looking at in terms of where might we move next or, get, or gather next? So we have a fairly, in, in, I think, a church search like this, a pretty tight window. Uh, I think realtors would be like, hey, you might want to expand that, but we're going to try to hold it within these parameters of uh, row to the, what is that, the east, Quivira to our west, 87th to our north, and College Avenue to our south. So that might feel kind of big, but it's actually pretty tight. And so that, that's part of what we're just, I don't know, that's part of our process also is going in that window. There may not be that many great options, but we're, we're 
trusting the Lord will provide, and, and we're seeing some cool stuff. So, um, what how about this one? Where, what kind of timeline, if any, do you think we could be expecting uh, given today? So that, it's a really tricky question. I think that my sort of gut reaction, and I think people on the committee probably share this, is that when you look around on a busy Sunday, it's pretty tight in here, but I think by the fall, certainly by the end of the year, we're probably going to outgrow this space and make it hard to um, bring in new people and have enough space to feel comfortable. Uh, We'd love to get into a permanent space, but I think more and more as we look at this, probably we're going to have another intermediary space that we would go into that we would lease on a Sunday that would be big enough to accommodate a bigger group. And then I think ideally we'd be maybe looking 18 months to three years at the longest to try to get into a permanent space after that intermediary space. If something opened up, like there was a nice church facility that we could make work, that would be probably the ideal situation and maybe something we would try to stretch to get into it earlier, but I think most likely we're probably looking at a larger um, temporary space. Yeah, and I'll just, I'm gonna close this in prayer. One, you know, a factor that is part of this also very obviously is finances. Uh, Mark knows our finances. Mark is also a board member of our church, if you didn't know that. So Mark is on our board of directors. Uh, and I would, I don't know if he would say this, but I would, I, for who we have, Mark is our numbers guy and knows our, uh, how to think about this financially. And so uh, even like looking at where, what can we do now, what can we do in the future, Mark is really helping us figure that out and uh, live within our means, but also uh, be aggressive when we can be. And so, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we don't have the intermediary step, but we might need to, and, and uh, we'll just see how God leads us in all of this. But ultimately it is like one of these things where in each of our real day, every lives, like we gotta just trust God. Like we hand it over to the Lord, depend on him and go as he leads us. Um, so with that, I'm going to close this in prayer, and let's all just pray over this. As you are praying throughout the week in your own prayer life, please pray for this. This is a, a difficult kind of process where it's like it's very out of our control in a lot of ways. We are trying to very much hear from God and discern his leadership and follow him. So please pray uh, in your own life, and let's just commit this to the Lord this morning. As I pray, please pray in your own heart and mind as you, as you will, and let's commit this to the Lord. God, we thank you that uh, we are even having this conversation uh, as a church, Lord, seeking to know and follow you into a new and next um, gathering location for this church as you grow us and as we seem to outgrow this space. Lord, we praise you for that because we see your hand at work and we're seeing your, uh, you, you growing us in depth and in new believing, new belief. Um, and we want to see that continue. Uh, so, Lord, we ask that as you continue to develop and grow and lead our church, Lord, help us. Give us the grace to know your direction. Uh, please give us the grace to wait upon you and to trust that you will guide us exactly as, as you desire for us, that you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, and, Lord, ultimately, we want to see you, you be glorified. We want to see your kingdom come. And so, as, as you direct us, Lord, help us to keep those things in our, in our purview and, and before us. Uh, teach us to be faithful. Help us to grow in faith. Lord, develop our church to be in this process, to even be uh, learning how to be dependent upon you and, and follow you in faith. Uh, give us wisdom. Give our, our committee and team wisdom as we work through this and as we move further down the line, Lord, please. Please give us unity and clarity um, and patience. We love you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat>、
his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love. of God's amazing love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence, trusting that he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Now let us confess our sins to the almighty God. Would you take a moment in personal prayer and reflection on these scriptures? Joel chapter 2. It says, Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. In Christ we are forgiven. In 2 Corinthians, let's read this passage out loud together. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
sang our freedom song. Now we are dancing on our chains. And we can't hold back our is Lindsay, um, and I'm excited to welcome you to Fountain City today. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Um, whether you're coming in and you've had a great week or you've had a hard week, however your morning's going, whether you're a longtime follower of Jesus or you're checking out the Christian faith, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, we've had a really fun week as a church. Our home groups are up and kicking and a um, great way to gather throughout the week. We had an awesome time at our ladies event this last Thursday night. Um, many of us were able to join for that. So just a lot of good stuff going on. We're so grateful. Um, I want to let you know of a few important things this morning that are upcoming. We don't have slides today, so you might want to write these down. Um, our next opportunity um, as a church to grow is a baptism class that's coming up on Sunday, April 7th. That will begin the next baptism class. Um, if you have not been baptized, um, and you're interested in being baptized or even just learning more about why God calls us to be baptized, why a follower of Jesus gets baptized, um, this would be a great opportunity for you. So more details will come, but keep that on your radar. Sunday, April 7th will be a baptism class. Um, and then Good Friday is coming up, obviously, with the Easter season. And so on Good Friday, March 29th, we will have a service at 7 p.m., here at Meadowbrook, and children are welcome to join. There will not be child care provided. We will not have nursery and kids class that night, um, so kids will be welcome to join in service. So Friday, March 29th at 7 p.m. Also, I'm going to invite Robin Smith and Eric Smith up quickly. Um, Robin and Eric lead one of our home groups that meets throughout the week um, in their home, and we asked this semester that each home group would try to come up with an opportunity for their group to serve, as well as an opportunity for their group to hang out socially outside of their, their time on Wednesday night. So Robin and Eric are gonna share with us the two opportunities that their group has, and these are open, that's why they're sharing, these are open to anyone who wants to join. Um, so go ahead. Hello, okay, good morning. Um, I don't, I believe these dates will be posted on the website, um, but we're just going to share tonight or today with you all. So our service event um, that our home group has chosen and everyone is invited to attend is going to be at Mission Southside. Um, they are a group out in Olathe that provide resources to individuals who don't have um, as many resources that a lot of us do in Johnson County. And so what we're doing is called um, Warehouse Sale Help. It's going to be uh, 
Thursday, March 21st, from 6.30 to 8 in the evening. And what we are doing is setting up um, like a warehouse for individuals to come shop. So we're going to set up tables, we're going to lay out all of the goods that they can get, and then the public comes in and shops and we come alongside and assist them. And then um, we carry their things out to their car. So this is an opportunity for adults as well as children who want to attend. Uh, the children will not be carrying things out to cars, so um, just the adults. But we will have, depending upon the children, we will have an adult um, per two to three children that they will be assigned to so they can walk with them and talk and there'll probably be other children there shopping with their families. So that's a fun time for the kids to connect. Um, so that's our service event. Then our fun event um, where everyone is welcome to come. If you're visiting and wanna get to know the church and other people in the church, this is a great social event to come to. It's going to be um, Wednesday, April 10th, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Chicken and Pickle at 135th and something in Overland Park. It's their south location. Um, but we are gonna have two courts reserved and we'll be outside in the you know, middle ground area. There's lots to do there. If you wanna play pickleball, great. If you don't, you don't have to. Um, but it's just to come and get to know people at the church. And we are also, Lindsay doesn't know this, but we're gonna use the um, little easel that says Fountain City, and we're gonna have that set out so you'll know when you walk in where to go. But it'll probably be in the center of, if you've been out to Chicken and Pickle, it's pretty easy to figure out. But anyway, everyone's welcome, and we hope you all come out. Jeffrey, did you wanna add anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you covered it, but um, no, we just love everybody join us uh, who could make it out um, for either event, really. Um, just an opportunity to serve together or just have fun together, get to know each other. Um, even more getting together in uh, more of an informal setting. But um, also, as Robin said, if you've been thinking about um, inviting anybody to church, friends, neighbors, just an awesome opportunity for them to come and get to know people um, in the church. So we look forward to it, especially if they like pickleball. So we're <laughs> thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eric and Robin. And thank you for leading the group for us. Such a blessing. All right. If you would stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning. Um, our passage comes from the book of Acts. Chapter 18, verses 18 through 28. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sancria because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man and with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew of the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. He was, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, providing from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you to Eric and Robin for coming up and sharing that with us. That sounds fun. We might have to join you in that. Don't let Doug come because he is a pickleball pro and will like hustle y'all. Um, hey, let me just say before we hop into where we're going this morning, uh, welcome. If you are new with us this morning or newer with us this morning, just a, a please feel welcomed and known this, uh, with us today. 
I'd also say, you know, something was really helpful for, for me a long time ago, a, a friend, mentor kind of person shared with me, like when you're looking for a new church, it's really helpful to give it a six, six step try or a six touch try that after six times of something, you'll actually really understand, hey, is this for me or not? Because it can be hard trying to find a new church. So if that's you this morning, I'd encourage you, hey, maybe stick around for six, six touch points with Fountain City Church to figure out, is this really for me or not? Um, this morning, we're going to do something a little bit new. Why not? It's turn the clock ahead day, so everybody's up for new stuff. Um, as we release the kids, we're going to send the kids out to their class here in just a minute. Kids ages three, four, five, six, and seven, you have your class. I'm going to invite everyone to stand up again during that time and just say hi to someone around uh, next to you. We're going to do the pass the peace meet and greet part of our service this morning and just say, hey, ask somebody next to you, what do you prefer more, turning clock ahead or turning clock back on these days? So why don't we all take a minute, stand up, kids, you go to your class in the back, and then I'll get us, I'll get us back here in a moment. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to get us all back together if I can. Go ahead and find your seats. All right, as we get into this passage this morning, I'm going to speak to our, our big kids who are still in the room with us. I know we don't have, a, it's spring break, so a lot of our folks are out of town today. Uh, but for our bigger kids who are still in here, I think most of you are over here this morning. But I want to just talk with you real quick as we get into this passage, because I know sometimes it can be hard to listen to me for 30 minutes and really keep up with what I'm saying, but you are part of our church, right? You're part of this church, and God wants to teach you through his word this morning. So let me speak to you for just a minute from this passage. There's one thing that we're going to be talking about in this passage. There's a lot of stuff going on, but one of the like words that comes to my mind as we're discussing this passage is the word ordinary. Ordinary. How would you describe ordinary? Do you know what that word means? When I think of ordinary, I think of like normal, maybe like not that special, just kind of like normal, not very unique, maybe not the best, just kind of ordinary. Do you ever feel ordinary? I see you raising your hands. Anybody ever feel ordinary? Like, yeah, I'm just kind of ordinary. I feel ordinary all the time. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Something that is awesome that we're going to learn today is that Jesus loves ordinary things and ordinary people. And he loves to work through, do things, special things through ordinary people for extraordinary outcomes or purposes. One of the things we're going to see today is that Jesus loves to work through ordinary people like you and me to bring his good news, his gospel, and his love to people all around us. Just by being his people, just by trusting him and following him and loving him through us, Ordinary people at school, in our neighborhood, with our friends, with our cousins, with our brothers and sisters, Jesus helps bring his love to those around us and his gospel to those around us. So we're going to be talking about that this morning, that even though we are ordinary people, everybody here is pretty ordinary, Jesus loves working through us to do extraordinary things. So our passage is going to help us see that a little bit this morning. So as I'm going, if you want to, I'm going to give you some notes, some points you can write down in your books. Go ahead and do that. You know, I thought this morning also, if I say something, you hear me say something, like, that's kind of interesting. I don't know if that ever happens for you, but maybe it does. You can write that down, or you can maybe draw a picture. If something's coming to your mind, like, that makes me think of this. Try to draw a picture of that. 
and you can, you can follow and take notes that way. All right? Now, why don't we all take a moment and pray and commit this time to the Lord. Pray for our kids in their kids' class this morning also, and we'll get deeper into this, this passage. Father, we thank you for this time and this morning. Lord, we thank you for the gift of this place, Meadowbrook, as we've discussed. Lord, you, you have blessed us here. You've provided for us here, and we're grateful. We thank you for the staff who helps us. We thank you for the beautiful scenery of the park outside. Lord, thank you for the sunshine this morning. Uh, thank you for the changing of the seasons, things turning green and buds coming out on the trees, a reminder of life out of death and how you are renewing all things, including our lives. God, as we open your word, we ask that you would teach us. Would you move among us with power through your Holy Spirit? Jesus, we want to know you. We want to hear from you. So would you speak through your word this morning? And would you give us power? And would you work with power in us that our minds might be renewed and through that we might be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus? In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing in a study in the book of Acts that we picked up last week. We actually began this study over a year ago. It was a year ago in January. We're picking it back up this morning. And one of the themes that we're going to see is very similar to what we saw last week. It's actually pretty similar to what we see through the whole book of Acts. These thrusts, these themes, these key points. And it kind of revolves around growth. Growth. The growth of the gospel. The growth of believers in Jesus, the number of believers in Jesus, the growth of the church. And for a lot of people, when we read through the book of Acts, it can be very inspirational. For others of us, it can be kind of challenging. And I think for a lot of us, if we're honest, it can also be, it can feel a little distant, maybe even a little irrelevant. You read all these stories that happened 2,000 years ago of like guys like the Apostle Paul, how God was doing amazing things. You hear today like ministry leaders and, and uh, you know, celebrity ministry people talk about things like this. Last week I know a number of people in our church were in Orlando, Florida for a big conference where they were talking about church planting. And sometimes you can hear people get up on a stage and talk about these awesome things that they've seen God do. And for you and me it can feel like, man, that's cool, I love that, but that's not my life. That's not me. My life is way more ordinary than that. Well, this morning we're going to cover this ground and we're going to plunge into this and realize that it's true and it's good that the, God wants the church to grow. It's true and it's good that God wants to develop us and others to be leaders in his church and ministry leaders. We're going to talk about that. And it's also true that God is doing something in your and my life as followers of Jesus that is bigger than we might re recognize, and that he wants to use you and me as ordinary people to continue to grow his gospel. That G God is all about the growth of the gospel in this world, and all of us, as followers of Jesus, have a part to play in that. So, last week, let me give you some context. We pick back up in the study of Acts, and you remember the, the, the thrust of the story is this. At the beginning of, the, of Acts, Jesus met with his uh, closest disciples, there were 11 of them with him, and he said, hey, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit upon you, the power of God, the presence of God in your lives, and he's going to fill you with power, and through that, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. You're going to tell people about me and what that means for them and why they should trust in me. You're going to do that all the way to, to the ends of the earth, and, we, and so far in these first 17, now 18 chapters, we've been seeing that process play out. We've seen the growth of the gospel, and in this passage this morning, which has a lot of things going on, and it can feel like there's, there's a lot of time actually bound up in this chapter, or this, this passage, there's probably several months, if not a year or more, bound up in these few verses. There's a lot of different people and places and parts, but in it, there's one big thrust, and God is showing us again the, the, that his mission of, of growth of the gospel of the church continues, and that God is using all of his people to do that that we are all part of God's mission. We're seeing that clearly in this passage. So as we get into this, the first thing I want us to see, the first point is going to kind of be the, the basic foundation of what this passage is getting at. If we did like a Bible study and said, what's the big point? I would probably pull this out and say, I think this is key. So the first point that I want us to talk about is this. God wants his church to grow through the gospel. And that might seem simple, but let's just talk about this. God wants his church to grow through the gospel. Now again, last week, more specifically, in our passage last time, setting up this one, we saw the Apostle Paul in a city in the ancient world called Corinth, which is today in modern-day Greece, or would be in modern-day Greece. And while he was there, Paul did what he did in every city he went to. He preached the gospel. That was his, his deal. And as he did that, we saw Jesus in a, in a dream speak to Paul very vividly and straightforwardly. He said, Paul, keep speaking. Don't be silent. 
Keep preaching the gospel, even when it's hard, even when people you know, don't really want you to. And he wants him to do this in part because, in part, he knew that people would believe him. Jesus knows that people are going to believe Paul as he preached the gospel because this is what God wants. This is why he sent the gospel. This is why he sends us as people to preach the gospel. Because, think about it, I know this is simple, but let's get this. Because through faith in Jesus, after hearing the gospel and putting faith in Jesus, we actually receive the salvation that Jesus came to give us, to provide for us. It's through our faith in Jesus that we actually receive the forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God that Jesus died on the cross to give us. Which we need because our sin cast us out of God's presence and kept us bound apart from him, but Jesus took that sin upon himself so we might be restored to God. It's through our faith in Jesus and receiving salvation. That's how we are renewed as broken people. It's through our faith in Jesus and receiving his salvation that we begin to finally now live life with God the way that God intended now and forever into eternal life in the new heavens and new earth. God wants, he wants you and me to hear this and he wants you and me to believe this, to receive this life that he calls us to and gives us in Jesus Christ. Now, all of this relates to the church, this word church. I know for a lot of us, man, that carries baggage, and man, it's a big topic or a big word, but essentially we can, we can boil it down to something pretty simple. And when I'm saying church, here's what we're talking about. The church is the collection of people in this world throughout time and history who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. People who have received this salvation. All of those people collectively are called the church. And God wants his church to grow. He wants his church to grow. That's what this, the book of Acts is all about that. This passage is all about that today. We can see it in a number of ways. I'm going to show you two big ones. First of all, think of Paul, his life and his ministry. The Apostle Paul, who's one of the key figures here. Through his life and his ministry, the gospel is going to more and more places and more and more people. That is the story of Paul's life. In this passage, we see it this way. So Paul was in Corinth last week, and now in, in this, last week, you know, last uh, chapter, chapter 18. But for us this morning, now he's moving on to this new city called Ephesus. So Ephesus would be across the Aegean Sea. It's on what would today be modern-day Turkey. So he goes over there. He stays for a few weeks. He did what he always did. He went to a Jewish place of worship, the synagogue, preached the gospel, made an inroads there, and then he for some reason, left to go back to Jerusalem, visited the church there, another place called Antioch, a lot of ancient places, and he went and visited other Christians and strengthened them. But if you think about Paul's life, over the course of his probably 30 years at least of ministry, he went to, he traveled thousands of miles. He went to dozens, if not maybe over a hundred cities in the ancient world to preach the gospel, because this is what God wants. He wants his gospel heard and believed, and he wants his church to grow. We also see it in another way. Secondly, through Paul's life, we see it in this way, that Paul invested in leaders so that they might now help the gospel grow and go to more and more places and more and more people. And we see that in this passage in a number of ways. Front and center here in this passage is a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. And we met them last chapter, last week in in the earlier part of chapter 18. Priscilla and Aquila were a married couple They were a Jewish couple who come from Rome, but they were expelled from Rome. They were kicked out of Rome at this time in history because the emperor of Rome uh, had this frustration with the Jews. He thought the Jewish people in Rome were causing a lot of problems, so he kicked them out. And so they they went to Corinth, and Paul met them in Corinth. We saw this last week, and they developed a relationship. They, They had a friendship, and we can know that this happened or developed over at least a year and a half. And so over this year and a half time together, they they become friends. And now as Paul goes to Ephesus in our passage, it says they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. They came with him. They've almost, they've become part of his team. And we know from the rest of the New Testament, other parts of the New Testament, that that's true. They did become part of his team. They were co-laborers with Paul. And he was pouring, you can imagine, just teaching them, helping them grow and understand the gospel more. And they had this relationship with him. And now they are going to have their own role in this. But investing in believers and growing leaders was central to Paul's work. It's all throughout the, this book of Acts, all throughout Paul's letters, because he knew that this would help get the gospel to more and more people, and the church would grow. That's important. God wants the church to grow by people believing the gospel. That's simple and elementary, but that's something that God wants to go from our head to our heart and be true that we know and hold to and are excited about as as his people. 
So God wants the church to go through the gospel for a lot of reasons. One of them we're going we're to discuss here is that he wants the church to do, or wants this to happen so that we, his church, his people, would grow in the gospel. So God wants his church to grow through the gospel. God also wants us, his church, to grow in the gospel. Now, there's another uh, character or person that is central in this passage who's really a fascinating character. His name is Apollos. And I want to read these verses about Apollos and kind of explain quickly some of these details that Luke gives us. Luke gives us, the author Luke, he gives us a lot of details about this guy Apollos, and it's not by accident. We're getting quite a profile of this man through these these descriptions. So let's pick it up in verse 24. It says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, so this guy's a Jewish man. He's from the Jewish faith. He's very familiar with, with the Old Testament. A native of Alexandria. Alexandria was the second biggest city in the Roman Empire. It was in northern Africa, very influential city. It was kind of like the center of learning in the ancient world. You, you could think of Boston with Harvard and MIT or wherever Oxford and Cambridge are in England. It was like that. They had the, the largest uh, library, ancient library, known as this incredible library that unfortunately was burned down in war, during a battle. But uh, Alexandria was the place of like this intellectualism in the ancient world. So Apollos is from there. He was also a learned man, an educated man, with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He's a smart guy. That's not just like, oh, he had like schooling. No, he like was, he he came from the schools, the best schools in Alexandria. This guy is smart and he has quite a pedigree of learning and education behind him. He'd also been instructed in the way of the Lord. So he knows about Jesus. He's been taught about Jesus. He knows Christian, the gospel, and Christian theology. And then after this it says, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. So he's, he's using his education, he's using these gifts that he has as an orator and a speaker, and he's teaching about Jesus. And he's doing that with passion, with vigor. And, and this, when it says with fervor, we could discern fr- from that that he's, he's doing this, like the Spirit of God is moving him in this. There's a spiritual fervor that God's Holy Spirit is giving him in this. So all of that is describing this man, Apollos, this like very accomplished, impressive, very impressive guy. But for all of that, he had somewhere to grow. It says this, at the very end of this description, all of that's true, but it says, though he only knew the baptism of John. Now, we're not going to go into depth in this. All this means is that He didn't know that there was another baptism that was for Christians in Jesus. He knew that there was this guy named John the Baptist, who we know earlier on in the Gospels, who was going around baptizing people. But he didn't know that there was this baptism piece that went with following Jesus. Now, that does not mean he was a heretic. That doesn't mean he was false in his understanding or teaching. It just means he was missing something. There There was room for him to grow. He still had something to learn. But then, so one day, this guy, Apollos, he did what Paul would do. He went into the Jewish synagogue, and in verse 26, it says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. That's what the Apostle Paul would do, right? He's preaching. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, these people who had been with Paul for a couple of years, ordinary people, Priscilla and Aquila did not have anything close to the resume of Apollos. These, these were blue-collar people. They were leather workers. They were tent makers. We know that from the last passage. They worked with their hands. These were not like your high-level, educated, white-collar people. These were just your, your hard workers, right? Your, your tradespeople. When they, heard, uh, when they heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. They're teaching this, this super brilliant, accomplished man the way of God more adequately. They're, they're filling in some things that he needed to learn. They're helping Apollos grow in the gospel. And there's two truths I want to pull out here and have us think about that are uh, helpful for us as we think about our own lives. Number one is this. We can all grow in our knowledge of the gospel. Every single person here can grow in our knowledge of the gospel. You can be walking with Jesus for 40 years, 50 years. You have not exhausted all there is for you to know about Jesus in his gospel. You can go to, to the person who has three PhDs in theology and biblical studies and all that, they still can grow in the gospel. All of us can be doing that. I had a conversation with a friend not too long ago. 
who was sharing with me, uh, he was talking about a sermon series that his church had been going through, and they were unpacking like, kind of the history that led up to Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They was kind of like explaining some of the context for the gospel. And he was telling me that, that through this sermon series, he was, he was kind of surprised by this, but he's like, God's been changing my life. I can't believe it. Like, it, it's incredible seeing all this come together, and God is really, like, changing me. My friend had been a Christian for many years, probably 10, 12, 15 years. But, and, and he wasn't, like, believing false things. He wasn't, like, believing heresy, the things that were untrue or whatever. It was just that his understanding was co- incomplete. He didn't know some of the fuller picture. But now through this series, the way of God was being explained to him more adequately. And as it was, as he was growing in the gospel, he was experiencing this new joy, this new peace, this new sense of vision and calling, this kind of courage that came with that. God was growing him. And it came through growing him in the gospel. So that's one thing we see. We can all grow in our knowledge of the gospel. Secondly, we see this, and this is hyper-practical. We grow in the gospel through community. We grow in the gospel through community. It's not exclusive to that, but in community is very, I don't know if it was weighted, 80%, 90%? We need to be in community to grow in the gospel. So you, you think about this in encounter of Priscilla and Aquila with Apollos. This is one of the best examples in the New Testament of real life biblical community and discipleship, of helping people grow in Christ, grow in the gospel, and follow Jesus more fully. It's awesome what we see here. Apollos needed other Christians to help him grow in the gospel. This amazingly brilliant and accomplished man, he needed that. You and I need other Christians to help us grow in the gospel. All of us do. We need that community. We need that community of of faith, the community of believers that God has called us to. Jesus wants us in community in part so that we can help one another grow in him. That's a huge truth that we see all throughout the scriptures. At our church, there's a number of ways that we do this. This is one of the reasons why we have home groups. Right? Gathering together in our groups is a way that we, in community, can help one another grow in Christ through Bible studies. I know we don't have as many of those as we would like. Someday we'll have more. I know there's one going on right now that I think is being very fruitful in, in some, some lives. And also just formal and informal mentoring and discipleship relationships. You know, I can't tell you how much God has grown me in my walk with the Lord through like, just a, getting a cup of coffee with a friend. And, and hearing something that I needed to hear about the Lord through that uh, interaction. Or ha- there's an, a couple that has invested years into my and Lindsay's life, just having us over for dinner, taking, you know, going out on like couples dates, um, just speaking into our lives and helping us know Jesus and hear Jesus and trust him and follow him. That's been huge for us. Uh, I had a, a, a man when I was in my late 20s, when I was in seminary, a uh, pastor, a missions pastor who formally mentored me for two years and we met every other week in his office and I can't tell you how blessed I was by that and how much God grew me I think as a man of God through that time it was such a blessing we grow in the gospel through community all of us need that and all of us can do that all of us need that and all of us can do that I mean again think about this relationship Apollos if he were in this in this room with us today we would be so intimidated by this guy like whoa, this guy needs center stage and we need to just sit and listen to him all the time, right? That's who he would be. But yet, and you have Priscilla and Aquila who do not have this resume at all, not even close. And yet, they had something to offer Apollos. And he obviously had something to offer them too. But all of us need this, this giving and all of us have something to give if we've been following Jesus. We all do. Now, before we we move on, um, I want us to see something in what happens here that takes place, takes place in our lives and hearts as we grow in the gospel. Like what, what, what actually kind of happens? What does God do in our lives? So think about this. I'm going to make this fairly quick, but think about this for a minute. When, when Priscilla and Aquila pulled Apollos aside and said, hey, why don't, you guys come, why don't you come on over for dinner and let's talk about this. Notice there is not a trace of evidence that Apollos got defensive or combative or like don't you know who I am you're going to help me you're going to teach me something about God 
Do you see where I come from? Do you know who, how well I do with this? Do you see the resume? There's not a trace of that. He was humble. He was teachable. And you think about Priscilla and Aquila, right? When Apollos, this guy they don't know, he strolls into town, and he goes into the synagogue, and he starts preaching. They don't look at him and say, like, hey, what are you doing? Do you know who was here? This is Paul's place. This is our place. You don't have a place here. Go somewhere else, right? They weren't competitive. They didn't, like, get their, their feathers ruffled and be like, get out, which, sadly, it's, it's embarrassing and it's sad, but it's true that this, that happens all the time today in just in, obviously, in everyday life, that happens in the workplace, that can happen in your neighborhood, that can happen in your own family. It also can happen in churches, where churches, like, start competing or get territorial or have turf wars or, you know, whatever it might be. It's like, oh, it's gross. But it happens. But how did Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos, why was this happening in their lives? Where there's, that's not going on. This is, like, this beautiful illustration of, like, grace and truth and humility and and teachability. Well, I would argue it's because they were actually growing in the gospel. They were growing in the truth of the gospel and believing the gospel and living out of that. They knew that they didn't have anything to gain or anything to prove because they'd already been given everything in Christ. They recognized their poverty, their spiritual poverty and, and their lack, and they realized all I have is from God and from Christ. There's, no, there's nothing that's about, this, or, uh, that's about me in this. It's about him. He was their righteousness. He was their strength. He was their hope. He was their joy. And they knew that everything they were doing in their life and in their ministry, they were doing for Jesus and about Jesus. He was the hero, right? His kingdom, his work, his glory is what they were about, not their own. They were growing in the gospel. That's what happens when we grow in the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for our life. That we become people like this, humble, teachable, united, giving ourselves to a bigger purpose than our own life, growing in the gospel. Now, as this happened, so they're growing in the, God wants his church to grow through the gospel. He wants us as his church to grow in the gospel. As all this takes place, we see that there's this, all of this is kind of cyclical. Uh, it's kind of circular. Because as this is happening, what's the next thing? What, what is, how does this passage end? Well, it ends with now Apollos and Everybody's spreading the gospel, which is the third thing, that God wants us, his church, to spread the gospel. Right? So God wants his church to grow through the gospel. He wants us, his church, to grow in the gospel. And God wants us, his church, to help spread the gospel. I, I was, had a conversation with a different friend of mine a, a few weeks ago, and he, we were talking about a lot of things, but in the course of our conversation, he said, oh, hey, I've known this guy for 20 plus years. He said, listen to this. I'm like, all right. You and, you know, I'm like, uh-oh. Uh, if you knew this guy, you'd be like, oh, what's coming? Um, he goes, I was baptized last fall. I went, what? He's like, yeah, I was baptized. And he couldn't wait to tell me that. Now, my friend, I've known him since high school. He's one of my best friends. We went to college together, roommates in college, really good buddies after college. His, his journey of faith was just a mess. I mean, it was, it was a mess. And for him to now be saying, I was, I was baptized, was a huge deal. But then after that, he, he, he just wanted to keep going. So tell me more. It's like, I can't wait to tell people about Jesus. I know I've known about Jesus for all my life, but I actually know Jesus now. And I can't wait to share that. I can't wait to serve him in my work, in my neighbor, in my family. It was just, it was awesome. And I think what it, what it illustrates for me, what I want to help us see this morning, is that what happened in my friend's life in this moment is exactly what Jesus intends to happen as we grow in him, as we grow in the gospel. As this life and forgiveness and hope and relationship with him is fresh and new, it it grows and it spreads through us, among us. I mean, we we see this in the tail end of this passage with Apollos, right? As Apollos was growing, he continued to grow, right? God is doing work in his life. What did he want to do? He wanted to move on to a new place. He wanted to go to this place called Achaia, which was close to where Paul was in Corinth. I don't want you to get lost in towns, but that's where he and Priscilla and Aquila were before this. Kind of close there, because he wanted to go do more ministry. He wanted to help spread the gospel. And then the, the Christians in Ephesus, whom he's with at the moment, they hear him say this, and they encouraged him in that. He said, yeah, that'd be great. And think about this. He was probably a huge blessing to them. If you've had people who are really good teachers and mentors and disciple people in your life, you're like, I would rather you not go somewhere because it's really good for me and I like having you around. It's like, you're like, okay, yeah, you should go. 
you have a gift that you can bring to them, you should go do that. And so they encouraged him, and they even sent word to the Christians that he was going to go visit. Like, this guy's legit, you should receive him. He's going to be a great help to you. And then as he got there, the last thing that, that Luke tells us about this is that Apollos was a great help to those who by grace had believed. And as he's, he's doing that through his ministry of uh, intellect and, and using a, uh, defending the Christian faith and all this, it says he was proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. He was preaching the gospel the way that uh, God wants his gospel preached. It's spreading through this man, Apollos. God wants his gospel to grow. He wants it to spread. He wants it to believe and take root. And he wants it to spread again. This is what we're seeing all throughout this, this reality of this passage and all throughout Acts. God's goal is the growth of the gospel, and we are all a part of that. We're all a part of that. Whether it's through believing the gospel for the first time, whether it's where we are in our lives now, growing in the gospel, whether it's in some, some position or some opportunity right now that God is using to help spread the gospel, we're all a part of this. And, you know, as I think about this, I think getting it more, like, down to that why level. Why is this a big deal? There, there's a lot of things that go through my mind. One of them is, you know, God wants this gospel to grow and wants his gospel to get out and, and be heard because ultimately we know people are being saved through that. The, 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 the word saved and salvation is all over the New Testament. There's a reality of we need to be saved from our sin and death. And only through Jesus is that possible. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. And God so loved the world that he gave his only, one, uh, only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have that eternal life. So God wants, that's, that's key, that's front and center, we know that. For individuals like us, God wants salvation to come. And I think, but as I was processing this some more, a, a story that I've been reading came to my mind. I, I uh, recently read a book called The Escape Artist. And it, it's a really fascinating book. It's also a really hard book to read. It's about one of the, there's four Jewish men who escaped from the death camp of Auschwitz in, uh, during World War II. So this man was one of the four, and he escaped. And so the book gives a really just matter-of-fact description of what took place in these camps. And it's just horrific when you read about every single day, one or multiple trains would pull up to this death camp with thousands of people in, you know, train cars, cattle cars, unload them, and within minutes, 90% of the people would be taken to a, a gas chamber and killed. Every day. You know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people were put to death in this place in Auschwitz. You go, well, how does that connect at all to what we're talking about today? Because as I read the book, a thought that kept coming into my mind was, man, praise God for Jesus and the gospel. Praise God that he is here. Praise God that he is causing his gospel to grow and to spread. Because even though this world will always have pain and death and sorrow in it until Jesus comes back, we know that as more and more people come to true saving faith in Jesus Christ, as more and more his gospel grows and his church grows, with true, I'll use some old-timey stuff, born-again spiritual growth, that darkness is going to shrink. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, there, God is punching holes in the darkness of this broken world through his gospel and salvation taking root in your and my life. So, yeah, bad stuff's going to happen, and there are Christians, people in the name of Christ, who still do bad things. But ultimately, I think the more and more the church grows, the less and less the darkness of this broken world will, will do what it does. And there is great hope knowing that God is at work in this world to beat that back, to, to, to make it less. That Lord willing, something like the Holocaust would never happen again because the church has grown in a place that it might otherwise have happened. God wants his gospel to grow. He wants his church to grow because through it he is spreading this new redeemed life of Christ all around us in our lives and through our lives. And every day, every day, even when it doesn't feel like it, every day when things are super ordinary, boring, mundane, normal, in your everyday life, in your everyday family, in your everyday workplace, Jesus is at work. 
he is at work. Priscilla and Aquila had no idea how God was going to work through them in this man's life. Apollos had no idea how he's going to work, how God's going to work through his life. You and me, have, you and I have no idea how God is at work right now in our lives as we just follow him, trust him, and his gospel grows in us. But he is moving and he is working. So as we wrap up, I want to I leave us with a couple of reflection questions to consider uh, this week. I'd love to encourage you to you know, think about these and, and pray about them over this week and ask the Lord to, to help you with your answers. Number one, what opportunities has God given you to help others grow in the gospel? What opportunities has God given you to help others grow in the gospel? Maybe a friend, maybe someone here at church, maybe with your kids. And then with that, what step could you take? What's the step you could take with that? That's all question one. Question two would be this. What's an opportunity that the Lord might be extending to help you grow in the gospel? What's the opportunity that the Lord might be handing you right now to say, Here, here's a, I'm giving this to you to help you grow in the gospel. And what's the step you could take with that? Again, let me close with this. God's goal in our life and through our life is the, is the growth of his gospel. And we are all a part of that. Let me pray. God, we do thank you that you are at work in our lives and that you have called us to this new and abundant and eternal life through Jesus. God, we pray that you would continue to grow us, your people, in the truth of who you are and what you're doing in our lives through Christ. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would give us a greater knowledge of of you, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to know the hope to which we've been called, that you would uh, give us vision to know you, our author and perfecter of our faith that we would know exactly what it means that you are our righteousness, that you are our strength, you are our shield, you are our our hope, and that in you we, we we are secure, we are home. Lord, please grow us and grow your your church here and through here, and may, Lord, your kingdom come and will be done more and more. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe the children, little children will be coming back in just a moment. And as they're on their way, I'm going to turn us to our time of communion. I know they're going to come in and have some crafts that they want to show mom and dad, so we'll be ready for that. But as we, as we turn now to the Lord's Supper and our time of communion, let me just remind us of what God is giving us here. As we turn to this table, God is bringing us again to the heart of, of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the heart of that good news is this, that that when we, you and I, were helpless in our guilt, helpless in our brokenness with God, Jesus took our sin upon himself. On the cross, Jesus took, he bore our penalties. He bore what was ours rightfully under sin and death. On the cross. And through his sacrifice, we are by faith forgiven. We are made right with God. This is being given to us again this morning. Through the bread and the juice, which are pointing us to the body and blood of Jesus, broken and and shed for us, we are receiving again this promise of God's redemption, his forgiveness, his salvation. So the invitation to us this morning is what it is every morning, that right now God is inviting you and me to receive again and afresh his grace to us that is in Jesus Christ. That as you come forward this morning, all of us who come forward are doing this, we are confessing, you are confessing your need for Jesus' redemption, that you need him to die for you. You confess that, yes, you have offended God. You have sinned against God. You are also declaring your trust in Jesus. You've entrusted your life to him, and you trust that he is the son of God who died for you in your sins, and that he has now cleansed you of those, and you are resting in his work to make you righteous before God. You're resting in him this morning also. You're also celebrating that this is true, and that you have now this eternal life with God both now and forever. So... If that is you this morning, this meal is for those who are trusting in Jesus Christ. If you have put your faith in Jesus, you trust that, yes, he is who the gospel says he is, and I'm trusting him as my Savior and my Lord, I invite you to receive communion this morning. Come up, and I'll give you the bread, and you can dip it in the cup and and go back to your seat. With that said, why don't we all stand up? And if you want to turn to page 11 in your worship order, you can follow along there. But let's hear what the Apostle Paul 
spoke to the church in Corinth about this meal, where he said this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus, when he took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now as one, as one church, let's declare the mystery of our faith together. That Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. The body and blood of Christ, broken and shed for you, receive in faith. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ of
Amen. Church, as you are sent this morning, may God open the eyes of your heart to know the hope to which you've been called, the hope of eternal life that he has begun in you and will bring to completion. And may you, dependent on him and empowered by the Holy Spirit, go forth from here with courage and joy in the gospel because you know it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. To the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Build your kingdom.